are listening to Empire Museum with Joe Maynard. Britain has a selective amnesia about its past and prefers to brush many chapters under the historical carpet. Empire Museum audibly imagines an unsanitized appraisal of Britain's past and examines legacies still reverberating today. Today's guest is Joe Mulhall. He is a historian of fascism and senior researcher at Hope Not Hate, the UK's largest anti-fascism and anti-racism organisation, where he monitors far-right groups and individuals. He runs Hope Not Hate's anti-Muslim monitoring unit, which tracks organised anti-Muslim groups in Europe and North America. He has completed a PhD on post-war fascism and sits on the board of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. Um, so I'd very much like to welcome you, Joe, to the show. Nice one. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, you're very much welcome. I should have said um, it's Do- Do- Dr. Joe, I should have said. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't have to worry about the doctor. I only make my dad use that. <laughs> uh, don't blame you there. All right, so I do want to get into the brilliant book that you wrote entitled British Fascism After the Holocaust, From the Birth of Denial to Notting Hill Riots. But before we kind of delve into some of the arguments of that book, I think it might be useful to touch on a little bit of context, um, which I think is going to elucidate some of the book's core arguments. So I want to start off by asking you, quite simply, what is fascism? How would you define it? I know it's famously quite a slippery and amorphous concept, um, and we could probably have a whole podcast about this one question, but you could just kind of sum up definition to get the ball rolling. <laughs> uh, this is a much harder question than it sounds. Uh, it's one of those ones that um, sounds really simple and should be really obvious, but it's but it's not in many ways. I mean, there is as much kind of ink spilled on what is fascism and definitions of fascism as there is almost is on what fascism actually did. <laughs> and um it's a vast debate, and, and unlike, I guess, communism and, and other kind of major political phenomenon, fascism lacks a specific founder, if you will, in terms of, so there's no kind of ideological text with which you can point to and say, you know, this is the Karl Marx of fascism, etc. There's plenty of people that attempted to be the Karl Marx of fascism, but none man- managed it. And so there is this kind of huge debate that goes on. Uh, and some historians argue fascism is a very specific Italian phenomenon, started in the 20s in Italy, and only fascism, real fascism, happened in Italy. Uh, other historians broaden it out and say that it included, you know, uh, Nazi Germany as well. And then uh, others broaden it beyond that and say that it's a kind of general phenomenon that you can uh, talk about that can exist beyond just those two specific fascist regimes in the, in the 30s and 40s. And then the other big debate is whether or not fascism exists after the war or whether or not it, it died in 1945. Um, and some people simply argue, yeah, I mean, fascism was, uh, you know, with the death of Hitler and Mussolini in 1945 and the end of the Second World War, fascism died as a as a useful term to describe political phenomenon that were groups, organizations, and activists. But uh, as a historian of post-war fascism, I obviously disagree with that. And, and I think that fascism should be understood as a much more general phenomenon, um, uh, kind of uh, what you might call a general type. Uh, and I think that both it can exist both pre-war and post-war. And I think it can exist well beyond the regimes of Italy and uh, uh, Germany. And one of the, the argue, uh, historians that's kind of perhaps best come or co- come closest to a consensus view is a guy called Griffiths. And his argument is that fascism is essentially palingenetic populist ultranationalism. And so if you take each of those, palingenesis is that it has this kind of mythical notion of rebirth at its very core, which is really important to fascist regimes, this idea that the, the nation is in crisis and needs to be resurrected and reborn. Um, it is ultra-nationalist in the sense that it has a kind of in-group and an out-group. It excludes uh, certain people from being part of the nation. Uh, and if you kind of combine that, which is this ultra-nationalism, this belief that not just that the, the, na- the nation is uh, supreme and is exceptional, and you tie that into this notion that there's a crisis and it needs to be rescued, and you tie this kind of nationalism, and then within that there's elements. How one defines the nation is important. For certain fascists, it's obviously uh, 
uh, a racial definition. For some people, it's a more cultural or geographic definition. But if you tie that all together, generally speaking, fascism is a form of kind of ultranationalism, and it is based on this concept of rebirth. Uh, and, of course, I would argue that intrinsic to the notion of fascism is, in practice, is racism, is kind of exclusionary politics. And then there's all these kind of side bits. There's the, some people point to the role of kind of like uniforms and militarization and a love of war and a love of conflict. Um, but, yeah, so I think that's the kind of best way to understand it is, is like a very extreme form of ultranationalism, and it, I guess, is the simplest way of defining it. Yeah, I think that's very well summed up. And I think just before I kind of asked you to further expand on your idea of uh, complicating the notion that fascism effectively died in the post-war period, um, just want to touch on the period of interwar fascism in Britain. It's an issue which has is, is gained a lot more kind of attention than your specific research, but also... Um, I think it's something that will be very surprising to very many people still. If you could just ex expand on the popularity of fascism in Britain in the interwar years between World War One and World War Two, and maybe just touching on the kind of popularity of the British Union in fascists and Oswald Mosley and that, w what happened in that period of time. Yeah, of course. Uh, so... Uh, like many places across Europe, uh, when fascism emerged in Italy with Mussolini in, in the 1920s or 1920s, you kind of got these copycat groups that emerged across the continent, and Britain was no different. It had a very small one called the British Fascisti, which, you know, Fascisti being a reference specifically to Italy, and, and then you have other groups like the Imperial Fascist League emerge, and you have all these kind of small ones. But the first major one of, of real importance is the British Union of Fascists, which emerges in, emerges in 1932. Uh, under the founder Oswald Mosley. Uh, and Oswald Mosley is no doubt an impressive figure in many ways. He'd been in both of the major political parties. M many people at the time called him the kind of the best prime minister we never had. But the British Union of Fascists, it kind of it emerges and with time it becomes increasingly anti Semitic. And the scale of it is actually pretty scary. I mean, at one point the party claims to have a membership of about 50,000 members. Uh, and famously, the press baron Lord Rothermere, who uh, kind of ran numerous major newspapers in the UK uh, offered support to the British Union of Fascists. Uh, and it grows and grows and grows, and it starts to become uh, a serious threat in some ways, not necessarily electorally, but but kind of on a street level as well. They had large rallies. They famously would have kind of street corner speakers. And uh, at some, they were filling out big places. The famous one is the Olympia Rally in 1934. Um, and the Olympia is, is the kind of the big, huge venue in West London, and the pictures are pretty terrifying. They look not too dissimilar to some of the stuff you'd see in Nuremberg. You know, thousands of people see Heiling, uh, all in black shirts. The party uh, rises up and it starts to, to grow and become increasingly problematic. But with time, by the time, by the kind of uh, the end of the party, if you will, comes in uh, May 1940, when obviously by this point the Second World War has begun and the British government essentially outlaw the British Union of Fascists. Um, throughout its history uh, in the 1930s, it faced kind of constant and often very militant anti-fascist resistance. Famously, of course, was the, the 1936 Battle of Cable Street in the London's East End. And, you know, again, there's a massive debate amongst historians about how important that kind of militant street politics was to uh, taking down the British Union of Fascists. But essentially, uh, by the end, uh, in 1936, you get the Public Order Act, which says that you're not allowed to wear uniforms anymore, and this is something of a hammer blow. And then come 1940, with the start of the war, and a fear that the British Union of Fascists could form some sort of fifth column in British politics, uh, should, especially should, of course, the Nazis invade, uh, the party is outlawed and most of uh, its hierarchy and leadership is imprisoned uh, without trial for, for a number of years throughout the war. Yeah, yeah, that's well put. And I think one interesting thing, just to comment on briefly, you kind of mentioned that, that Oswald Mosley was seen as kind of an impressive figure throughout the 1930s. Um, and this, I find it interesting, the kind of peculiar celebrity cult which followed him is often being photographed in kind of sporting poses and was dubbed, I think, the, the kind of ruled of Valentino fascism, which effectively in modern day terms is like, effectively like saying the kind of Leonardo DiCaprio fascism. Yeah, uh, yeah this odd kind of youth image, which is contrasted with the kind of old gang of elderly politicians. And I've read some historians kind of talking about his exotic appeal 
and kind of potent sexual energy contributing to this kind of weird celebrity body cult. But I think that's kind of a humorously juxtaposed with this um, kind of iconic video which surfaced on Twitter, I think, in the last couple of months, and it's Danny Dyer's take on the on the Battle <laughs> of Cable Street. Yeah. And he, he's like Oswald Mosley in his black shirts, not a boy band, but a bunch of fascist slags, and then goes on to just call him quite simply a melt. Um, well, it's funny. I mean, because because in some ways, I mean, you, there is some footage of him and there's recordings of him, and like, there's no doubt that Oswald Mosley was intellectually impressive. You know, he was a member of Parliament for the Labour Party for a number of years, and he was, I think, um, you know, ha- held quite prominent prominent roles, and he was deemed as impressive. He was, in some ways, quite young and dashing, and of course, he was also married um, to the kind of Kardashians of the time, if you will, which was the Mitford sisters, one of the Mitford sisters, who had previously been married to. Uh, the Guinness family, and the Mitfords were some ways, you know, they were like a very famous family at the time. It was a group of young women, and, and some of them supported communism. Some of them, one of them, fell in love with Hitler. Uh, one of them married someone who went and fought in the Spanish Civil War, and one of them ended up marrying Oswald Mosley. And so there was this kind of celebrity element. And if you look back at the newspapers at the time, and, and especially those that followed around the aristocracy, Mosley and his wife Diana are in there quite a lot um, as this kind of celebrity couple. But at the same time, there's all, there was also this British tradition of, of mocking Mosley and mocking fascism, which still exists to this day. And like P.G. Woodhouse is famous, the black shorts. He talks about, you know, uh, this figure called Spode, who essentially is like a, a Mosley figure, where he's ridiculed for his kind of author- authoritarianism and his silly uniforms. And, and so there's always been those two sides. But there's no doubt that Mosley, you know, there's a, there's a reason. Uh, Graham Macklin, the historian, talks about coterie charisma and the importance of his charisma for kind of inspiring loyalty. And he inspired loyalty to, to large numbers of people, not just in the 30s, but through the war years and then into the post-war years. People dedicated their lives to this guy, despite the fact that, uh, you know, it's very hard to argue he was anything but a failure for this whole, you know, for this whole fascist career. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And a really yeah, <coughs> odd, odd kind of uh, dark glamour about him and this kind of odd mesmeric rhetorical style when you watch some of his videos but I mean everything he's saying is ridiculous and abhorrent but yeah I think there definitely is something there Mm. um so I think that's a fair summary of the kind of interwar years um which I think is a necessary prerequisite to talking about your book British Fascism After the Holocaust um so we could just kind of start off by telling us a little bit about what's in there that broadly Yes. So the book actually starts in 1939, basically, as kind of the war starts, Second World War starts. Um, it picks up, basically, I think is, is the most understudied, but also, I think, quite an important period of British fascism, when essentially British fascism was at its lowest ebb. So it tracks it from 1939 through to the Notting Hill riots in 1958. And it tracks this like, small group of British fascists that as I say, had kind of been active during the 1930s. The war starts. Many of them are arrested. Some of them are not. Uh, Many of them are interned in British internment camps throughout the war. And then the big bit of the book, I guess, is seeking to understand, really, how how is it that people still believed in fascism in 1945 uh, and after the war? How is it that after the unbelievable scarring images of the Holocaust, you know, Jewish bodies being pushed by bulldozers into mass graves... Um, you know, the news of Auschwitz, Belsen, Buchenwald, all, all these horror stories and horror, uh, the true horror of Nazism being revealed. How is it that there was this group of people that still believed in fascism and not just believed in it, but sought to resurrect it in Britain? And um, I mean, of course, the major architects of, of fascism were dead by 1945. Hitler's gone, Mussolini's gone. Uh, all over Europe, you've got people that are either dead or on trial. But Mosley wasn't, of course. He survives the war. He's in prison for chunks of it. But he comes out and, and very quickly starts to try to resurrect it. And for a number of people, they never stopped trying to, to fight fascism, even through the war years. So the book kind of traces that, and it tries to explore, from you know, the late 40s, how is it that they dealt with things like the Holocaust? And, of course, for many cases, it was they denied the existence of the Holocaust, which I'm, I'm sure we'll come on to. But how is it that they tried to get out of this kind of political ghetto in which they found themselves, when, of course, Britain in, the, in, the, in those years, was uh, there was a post-war anti-fascist consensus. Britain was the country that had fought Hitler, that fought the Nazis, stood alone, if you will, uh, as, as was the story. And as a result, the climate was extremely hostile to anyone attempting to resurrect fascist politics. And so how did they do it? And then it starts to look at the effect of things like non-white immigration, 
uh, throughout the 19, late 1940s, you have the arrival of Windrush, you have the arrival of West Indians and Indian communities arriving in, and growing in Britain, and looking at the far right's reaction to that and starting to see throughout that period how they start to become increasingly anti immigration, anti-black racist racism starts to replace anti-Semitism in some quarters as a way to try and find a route back to acceptability. Um, so it's this kind of, I think, quite a, a seminal period for British fascism in that it has this kind of hinge point between the pre-war period and the post-war period. And, and a lot of the people that get involved in that period become major figures in the kind of the growth of British fascism and the British far right in later decades with things like the National Front. Uh, yeah, and I think a good way to kind of further elucidate this argument of yours of kind of the unbroken thread is to look at how even during the war itself, fascism wasn't extinguished. Um, in your book, you draw attention to this national graffiti campaign during the blackouts. So when the kind of blitz were happening, some some cities would kind of be littered with horrific anti-Semitic kind of slogans and also the continuation of that black marketeer slur, which kind of implied that uh, Jewish people were disproportionately profiting from the uh, the black market, which waged during World War Two, outside the ambit of the like the ration economy. And then an- another way that you draw attention to the fact that fascism wasn't extinguished during the war years was this collective internment um, of some of the key fascist ideologues. So maybe you could just expand on what that process was and, and, and why it perhaps didn't have its intended effects of quelling a fascist uh, thought in Britain. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, funny you mentioned the kind of some of those graffiti campaigns on the blackout. I mean, um, we're obviously recording this during COVID and during lockdown and, and there's this like endless references to the blitz spirit and stuff you see in the newspapers. And of course there was some of that, but, but elements of it were also a myth. There was waves of crime and there was also waves of fascist activity which explicitly used things like the blackout to carry on spreading anti-Semitism and pushing kind of extreme far-right politics. So it is quite interesting when this kind of deification of the blackout period and the blitz spirit and all those things, which which is partly true but also partly not true. But yeah, I mean, uh, the detention of British fascism is really, really important. So the British government passed Defence Regulation 18B, which is basically about you can intern without trial people who are members of British fascist organisations or who security services decided were a danger. And large chunks of the British Union of Fascists, but also other fascist and far-right parties were swept up by Defence Regulation B. Um, I think there was about 780, if I remember off the top of my head, but you've probably read, well, you've read my book certainly more recently than I have. <laughs> and um, they get interned and they get interned in various places and kind of they build a set of camps. And these in the early days, these camps were a weird hodgepodge of British fascists uh, Italian civilians, German civilians, even some Jewish people. That you get this, these harrowing stories of Jewish uh, Germans who had fled after Kristallnacht, coming to Britain and then being interned in the Second World War because they were German and finding themselves in camps with British fascists. But in some ways, it's like you know they're boxed up and they're put away in these camps. And for some people, that's the end of the problem. You know, Mosley ends up in Holloway Prison, as does his wife. Um, but others end up in these kind of camps uh, in various places around the country. And what's quite ironic about it is in one sense, of course, it was about protecting Britain from, you know, should there be an invasion, which by the early 1940s, uh, part of the war looked very like it was going to happen imminently. What would happen if you've got all these fascists running around in the streets helping the Germans? Um, and so they decided to try and stop it. And then, you know, in one sense, it makes sense, although they did, of course, suspend habeas corpus for it, which, which may, remains controversial. Um, but what ends up happening is you get all these fascists from all over the country and they're all taken and they're all put together in a camp. And rather than them not becoming fascists or moving away from fascism and seeing the error of their ways, essentially it becomes like this hothouse, this kind of uh, this space whereby all these fascists come together, sit around in the evening, give each other's lectures, reaffirm their commitment to fascism and um, there was like little groups that came up one was called Hail Mosley and Fuck em All uh, and that was in one camp and it was about coming together and learning from each other and what you actually find is a lot of these people went on a kind of journey of even further radicalization in these camps so there's that one element where you find all of these things if you go to the archives where people are saying I met so and so from the northwest branch of the British Union of Fascists I'd never met them before but we're now really close friends and so these networks become strengthened in some ways and then the other element is, is they all survived. You know, 
huge chunks of fascists were obviously shot across Europe for all sorts of reasons, but not least you know, during the war. And then we have trials after it. But British fascism, in some ways, of all the key players, or most of the key players, emerge out in 1945 as the war ends, the cannons fall silent, if you will. And this whole group of people, British fascism, are then just uh, released, many of which are kind of released from 43 onwards. And they're all alive, and they're all in contact, and they're all working together. And while some people obviously fade away and decide it's not for them, the most committed and core activists emerge out into the end of the Second World War, just as radical, just as fanatic, in some cases more so, and also interconnected and networked across the movement. So in some ways it backfires. British fascism, This is, it's like it, rather than crushing British fascism, that, those years were a period that essentially the torch of interwar fascism was nurtured uh, and ready to be used again in the post-war period. Yeah, it's a really curious kind of phenomenon there where it works as kind of an incubator it's, ideas. And it's a difficult one, though, because I don't know what else, you know, I mean, Britain was imminently facing invasion. It's a really difficult year. It's quite, I think it's quite easy now to look back and say, well, wouldn't it have been great if there'd been all, uh, everyone had been tried properly and there'd been all those sorts of things? But I think it's very difficult to judge that historical period by today's standards on this. And, and you know, many of these people were fanatically pro-Nazi or, you know, fanatically pro-fascist. And um, would have likely or would have almost certainly in many cases supported Nazi invasions and become something of a fifth column. So in some ways it's a difficult one. I don't know what else the British government could have done beyond lock them up, but other than perhaps keep them slightly more separate. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I suppose it's all right having the benefit of hindsight, but yeah, that's that's true. What about the, the, the Palestine crisis and the, and the subsequent anti-Jewish riots? Could you just quickly uh, tell us a little, about, a little bit about what, what went on there? Because I think... That's definitely um, an historical chapter, which I think a lot of people won't really know much about at all. Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting one, and it, it, it's, well, it's quite remarkable. In, in one sense, of course, as I say, like, from 1945 onwards, the newsreels in British cinemas are showing this uh, horrific reality of anti-Semitism with the camps and, you know, especially, obviously, lots of awareness around Belson. Um, so you, one would presume that there would have been a, nat- you know, a natural outpouring of sympathy for the Jewish people and of course for, for many for many people there was but also as the war finishes uh, Palestine at the time is a British protectorate you know, within the British Empire and throughout the 1920s and 30s but long before that as well there's been high levels of Jewish or Jewish immigration into Palestine with the notion of creating up a creating a Jewish state and the British find themselves in this kind of slightly peculiar situation where they are having to manage both uh, manage Palestine, where they have a, a kind of Arab communities and existing Arab nations around that region saying that they must stop Jewish immigration. You have uh, Holocaust survivors who have understandably decided that it's incredibly necessary that they have a homeland because uh, of what has just happened. And the British uh, struggle to try and find a way to deal with this. And what you end up is uh, with, you end up with kind of militant groups, uh, Jewish groups based in the area, attempting to create a Jewish state and to get rid of the British. And um, this causes a real backlash within Britain, uh, especially after a number of things. The, the two big events, one is called the Sergeant's Affair, which takes place in July 1947, um, during a kind of Jewish insurgency in Palestine. And basically, the Jewish group called the Irgun kidnapped two British army intelligence officers a guy called Clifford Martin and uh, Mervyn Pace. And basically they hang them uh, in a uh, in a field, also not in a field, from, from a tree, and then they kind of mined the ground underneath. And, and basically the newspaper images of these two hanging British bodies uh, are put across the British newspapers and um, cause huge amounts of outrage in Britain. And a lot for them, lots of people, the narrative is very much... How can, you know, we've just fought a war to, to help the Jewish people and now they're doing this to us. And this backlash causes a real problem. And then the other big one is the bombing of the King David Hotel. And um, this is uh, causes a huge amount of loss of life. And the King David Hotel in Jerusalem was basically um, where a lot of the British soldiers, a lot of the British army was based. And it was a terrorist attack carried out in July 1946. And again, uh, by kind of militant Zionist groups like the Irgun. And it kills... Uh, 91 people, uh, and it injures a further 46 people. And again, uh, the images of this, if you Google them, I mean, it takes out half the building. It's, it's a really remarkably sized bomb. And this causes huge amounts of tensions. And in the UK, 
the backlash takes the form of, uh, which now seems remarkable just years after the Holocaust and the revelations of the Holocaust, but you see riots, anti-Jewish riots in, in different parts of Britain. There are synagogues burnt to the ground. Uh, you see in parts of the northwest like Liverpool, you see Jewish shops being smashed and images that are terrifyingly reminiscent of some of the things like Kristallnacht taking place on the streets of Britain. And you get like the anti-Jewish uh, or anti-alien petitions in Hampstead in North London. And yeah, it's this terrifying thing where clearly the lessons of the Holocaust had not been uh, understood and the backlash and the, the anger at the Jewish people for the, you know, the collective Jewish people as, as many of these people felt um, resulted in terrifying scenes and terrifying rises in anti-Semitism in the UK. And for some fascists, of course, this is extremely exciting. Um, after several years of thinking there's no way that anti-Semitic politics is going to play in Britain after the war, uh, they see a kind of little light for them. They see an opportunity here to say, hang on a second, lots of people still dislike the Jews. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a terrifying and slightly sad and overlooked chapter in British post-war history. Yeah, definitely. Extremely, extremely sad and shocking, actually. But thankfully, the kind of widespread societal anti-Semitism that those anti-Jewish riots kind of hinted at didn't really kind of take hold to be representative of society as a whole. But nonetheless, it did obviously pursue and continue with the far-right fascist organisations in the country. So if we could just kind of segue on to talking a little bit about Holocaust denial. I think you mentioned it earlier, but this question of how is it possible for people not to believe with such def def definitive evidence? And how can these images not arouse sympathy and horror? Like, have you got any sort of hypothesis onto the how? And also just broadly speaking, how did Holocaust denial kind of unfold in the period that we're discussing? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, in some ways it's, it's, it remains unbelievable, right? How one can see those footage and hear the testimony of survivors and, and listen to the testimony of British soldiers at the time, um, listen to the radio reports from Belson that were played across the BBC and the newsreel footage and, and decide that it wasn't true. Uh, it almost seems incomprehensible. And so what you, I guess you have to almost try and, and do rather uncomfortably to understand it is place yourself in the, the foot of... Uh, you know, in the shoe of the British fascists themselves or fascists themselves. Now, the first Holocaust deniers were, of course, the Germans uh, and the, the Nazis in the sense that they attempted to cover their tracks. But for many fascists, they had spent their entire lives being told and believing that the Jewish people ran the world secretly, that the Jewish world conspiracy was real, that the protocols of the learned elders of Zion was real, and Jewish people uh, secretly pulled the strings and ran the world. In which case, if you genuinely believe that Jewish people are secretly all-powerful, how do you explain the death of six million Jews uh, in Europe? It it's, uh, creates a huge paradox, which is very difficult to get over. Now, for some fascists, um, it was too big a paradox to get over, and they obviously move away from fascism or they, they turn away from uh, British fascist politics. But for others, the obvious answer is, is that it didn't happen. Um, they were so wedded to their existing anti-Semitic beliefs about Jewish power that the easiest way to explain the Holocaust is to say that it didn't happen. Now, it's always difficult to kind of take away those people that said they didn't think it happened because they thought it was politically expedient versus the ones who genuinely didn't believe it happened. But if you look at the British fascist scene of the period, you get a whole host of reactions. As I say, some people turn around and say, this is appalling, I can't believe it happened, this is outrageous, um, fascism's not for me. But a bigger chunk of most of the organized individuals try to explain the Holocaust away. And that ranges from some people saying that the camps were not death camps. They were camps for people with typhus or they were camps for people that were ill or sick because of things like British bombing, British carpet bombing, um, or that the camps were necessary because the Jewish people had declared war on, uh, on the Nazi party some decades previously. And as a result, they, they had to put the Jewish people in prison. Um, other people obfuscated and said, uh, is this any worse than things like the British bombing of Dresden? or Hamburg, and said that there was a kind of moral parity there in terms of what was happening, and this was just a, this was what happens in war. And other people, of course, blamed the Jews and said uh, the Jewish people started the war and terrible things happened during war, and as a result, it's their fault. And so you get all of these different reactions to it, some of them kind of explaining away bits, and then some of them outright denying it. 
And what's really interesting, most of the literature on early Holocaust denial points to a whole host of people. Uh, people like Bardesh in France, the Rassignier in France, or various Americans or various Swedes. Uh, and partly, uh, understandably, those fascists became much better known Holocaust deniers. But actually, if you dive into the British archives and look at this, uh, and you look at who was writing on the far right at the time and what they're producing, I think it's possible to argue, and I, and I argue in the book, that actually Holocaust denial as we've come to know it in its proper form actually started in Britain. The earliest examples I could find were British. They were not French and they were not American, uh, which is quite a sad and kind of ignoble thing for, for Britain to have. But many of the kind of key tropes of Holocaust denial, things like the photographs and the newsreels being created and, and manufactured that are, are thought to happen or be created as ideas later, you can find in Britain throughout the, the even towards the end of the war by various fascist groups and individuals. Yeah, I think the really odd obsession with anti-Semitism uh, that many on the far right had during the 1950s can kind of be used as a bit of a segue to talk about how your study of the reactions to immigration effectively complicated the idea of a tolerant country uh, with an extreme racist fringe. How you talk about that the far right were quite slow to react to various waves of immigration which came over from the Commonwealth during the 1950s. And yeah, if you just expand on that and kind of what lessons you learned from that. Yeah, I mean, this is all also depressing. I mean, the whole thing is depressing. I don't want to give the idea that the book isn't. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I think there is uh, difficulties that we've built this myth of British tolerance, which is which is lovely, and in some ways there is elements of truth to it. You know, Britain does have traditions of tolerance which are really welcoming and exciting and lovely, but often I think we frame fascism and the far right in the UK in an incorrect way, uh, and I think we we basically argue that the body of British politics and the body of Britain is a healthy, positive, tolerant thing, and then there is this cancerous tumor that hangs off its right side. Uh, which is the far right. And if we can just cut away that cancerous tumour, then the body will be healthy again. And the sort of, or, you know, like a gangrenous limb, if you will. And if we chop it off, it'll stop the spread of these ideas into what is essentially a healthy body. I think it's uh, unfortunately a slightly naive way to look at it. And, and what I was expecting when I went in to do the research for the sections that how did the British far right react to things like Windrush, I was expecting they would be jumping up and down with outrage as soon as the, the first newspaper articles emerge about boats arriving from the West Indies. And I found nothing. You know, if you went through at the time, you know, British Union of Fascists had gone, but the union movement had emerged in the, in the late 40s, which was also an old party organised by Oswald Mosley. You also had a guy called Arnold Lees, who was a rabid and fanatic anti-Semite who ran a fascist movement at the time. And then another key figure was A.K. Chesterton. But you had all these small fascist groups as well. And I went through all of the newspapers expecting them to find them, especially with the arrival of things like Windrush 47 and the boats in 47 and 48, and they just don't mention it. And yet if you look at the uh, first mentions of non-white immigration, or what they would call mass non-white immigration in the 40s, in fascist newspapers, it's actually reporting on other people getting angry about it, people like trade unions, people like major political figures, political commentators and the like, they're very much reacting to a broader societal anger about it. And obviously if you look at things like the official records of the, you know, the Labour Party at the time and you go into the Home Office files and stuff, there was a huge amount of trepidation about it. And then of course you know, Churchill comes back to power in 51 again and some of the rhetoric that he was espousing around immigration and, and his cabinet about interracial mixing and polyglot nations and all this stuff is really, really ugly. And Really, so rather than kind of the more comforting idea that British fascists were racist and anti-black and anti-immigration, and they pushed this narrative and it took hold and infected British society, I think the reality was actually is that the British society had this deep strain of racism within it, and the British fascists sought to exploit that. Uh, and it's really interesting if you read kind of novels from the time written by West Indian immigrants. My favourite one is Sam Sylvan's um, Lonely Londoners, which is a brilliant novel. And they talk, he talks in it about there's the character and they're living in these houses in West London and lots of them are living in the same houses and, and how they would knock on a door to rent a flat and say, um, have you got any rooms to rent? And the, and the person would say, I don't have any problem with a black person living here but my neighbours just wouldn't have it. And then he knocks on the door next to that person and, and the person says, I'd have no problem but my neighbour next door just wouldn't have it. This kind of slightly guarded British form of racism which was obviously much less explicit and pronounced than, say, 
what was happening in North America at the time with the Jim Crow laws, but it was there nonetheless. This kind of fear of uh, you know non-white people taking over Britain, uh, mixing the blood pool and the gene pool, and all these sorts of things. And so, yeah, that's why I argue that I think it challenges this tolerance myth, which is, um, you know, Britain has always been welcome to immigrants, because I think lots of people have just never bothered to read what the immigrants at the time were saying, what their experiences were like, and what they, how they felt, how unwelcome it was. And this is why you then start to see British fascism. Uh, now we live in an age when every kind of wave, as they call it, of immigration arrives, the British far right jump up and down on it, whether or not that was, you know, the Ugandan Asians in 72 or whether or not it's what we've seen this summer with cross-channel migration. They're all over it. They, they, they know exactly what they're doing and they're opposed to it. That's not what happens in 1947. The British fascist movement is still talking about Jewish people. You know, it talks more about Japanese people in the newspapers, in the far-right newspapers, than it does about non-white immigrants. And it's only with time that they start to see this growing societal disquiet about immigration that they then change and they start to see it as a route back to the mainstream um, it's not that it's they, they also dislike black people it's not just cynical they do they are actually of course racist but they start to see it as a major issue once they believe that it might be a route for them back into the politics uh, you know pushing holocaust denial and pushing anti-semitism in the 1950s is not an easy gig um, but turning around and saying that we are here to stand up for white british people in the face of a non-white invasion uh, is a much more profitable political strategy for them, and they start to see that. Uh, yeah, and I think that, yeah, very convincing argument there that uh, oftentimes the far right following societal racism and echoing the views of uh, lots of the British public. And I think your example of the kind of Notting Hill riots in, of 58, in which the far right basically, you argue that they didn't anticipate it and they didn't necessarily uh, fan the flames beforehand. I think I think that's a good way of proving it. And also, you can imagine for the immigrants at the time and, and, and still now, I suppose, the kind of that polite British racism is arguably kind of worse than when it's more overt, because at least then they kind of know where you stand, say if it was in North America. I suppose they have more of a clear idea, but the insidiousness of it and, you know, not getting the proper jobs or the housing is, is quite a cruel way of, of going about it. And Absolutely. Then, and if you look at, like, I mean, it's funny you say that, if you look at, the Lone Londoners book, they literally say that. Say, like, they have a debate in there about what's better. And, they like, and some, some people in the, in the novel say, well, at least in America we know the rules. And um, so, yeah, I think that, that, that that was a kind of discussion that was happening. And Notting Hill, as you say, is really important. I think that, again, that's like, obviously it's a blot on the history of the post-war Britain. It's this terrible moment of racial violence. It starts in Nottingham. Uh, there's racial violence there. And then in, this is 1958. And then you see the Notting Hill riots in West London. In the same year, and, and for a long time, or for some many of the books you'd read about it, you would have thought that it was just this gang of marauding fascists that turned up from somewhere else and started kicking off. And, and the truth is, it's not that. The truth is, if you look at what the fascists and the far right parties of the period were doing, I mean, Mosley was not even in the country at the time. He was kind of caught on the hot by it and has to rush back. Other people are they're campaigning in different parts of the country, and then the fascists turn up when they decide to exploit. The racial violence which is happening uh, on the streets of London and so it's very much yeah I think it is a concrete example of that idea of British fascism seeking to exploit racism rather than being the primary driver of it. One thing I'm really interested to hear your opinion on is that do you have any kind of hypothesis for the cause behind some of this hatred that we're kind of talking about now because all this like shocking shocking hate and then you kind of just can't help but wonder where has it come from and in all your research and also your the work you do at hope not hate you've kind of really delved into the belly of the beast here and this sort of forensic analysis of uh you know what these guys are thinking um and then it's often you know uh, you hear the kind of socio-economic explanations um which seem to explain part of the story like the british union and fascists uh, gain most of their support from the kind of poverty-stricken areas in like London's East End, Leeds Hall, Manchester, places that really feel in the brunt of unemployment in the um, interwar period, and then and then the classic ones, kind of Hitler's rise to power, being predicated on the kind of crippling economic sanctions imposed uh, upon Germany by the humi humiliating Treaty of Versailles. Um, but then it just, and then there's also maybe the kind of emotional side to it who's speaking earlier about the kind of dark glamour of 
of Mersley and his oratorical, confident sportsman style. But then I just, but, but I, I, I kind of struggle with this question of the kind of why behind the hate. Um, and yeah, just wondering if you've got an opinion on, on, on that, on the why. Yeah, I mean, this is the question, right? Uh, if we and, and if we ha- if we had the answer, then we we wouldn't be still fighting these battles. But um, I think there there is some things we can look at now. The big the big debate here is this kind of you mentioned is, is like culture versus economics, and um, and I th- this is the battle that rages now in kind of social science literature when they talk about the contemporary far right, and and even things like Brexit and and all these things is was it economics that was the driver for these things or was it kind of cultural antagonism, fear of demographic change, etc. And like I always think the role of the historian is, is uh, in fifty years time is going to argue that it was of course both. And um, these things are deeply interconnected. And if you look at British racism, there is some of it is a, a long-standing heritage, uh, kind of institutionalized systemic notions of racism that were built into centuries of colonialism, imperialism, all of these things where non-white people were deemed to be uh, inferior, different, and a threat. Um, Anti-Semitism sits slightly separately in that, of course, you have this uh, strange paradox whereby the Jewish people are supposedly all-powerful but also subhuman. Um, so that you have these kind of, uh, there's a bit of a paradox within that. But when it comes to kind of the post-war racism thing, yes, of course, there is an economic issue to this. Uh, there is, uh, you have a period, I mean, Britain at the time is on its knees, it's rebuilding itself, it's economically deprived, you still have rationing, all these sorts of things. Now, of course, large numbers of the non-white migrants that were that came to Britain in the immediate post-war period did so to help rebuild Britain. They did so to help create the National Health Service, to, to build the bombed-out cities of London and Britain and all these things. Um, but, of course, for some people, the argument is, is they're coming to take our jobs. And that you hear those narratives then as much as, uh, as you do now. The idea that if you are economically deprived, you are especially low-skilled, um, migrant communities are framed as a threat to your well-being, a threat to your way of life, a threat to the going to drive down wages. So there has always been those economic drivers. Um, you know, if you even if you look at things like the rise of the British National Party, many many decades later, some people argue that you know the rise of the BNP happened during a period of huge economic growth for Britain. But if you go to places like Dagenham, Stoke, and Burnley, where the British National Party was strongest, those communities had not felt that economic growth. So there is always been, I think, an economic element to it. But there is, of course, a cultural one to it as well. Fear of change, fear of an other, fear of an outsider. And that sort of stuff is based on huge levels of ignorance, but also social norms of the period. You know, in 1945, the British Empire still exists. Uh, For the last uh, 200 years, there's been this supposed civilizing mission to go around the world and educate these backwards barbarians and now these backwards barbarians that the British Empire has been telling people about for two centuries are in London and uh, it's no great surprise that huge chunks of the British populace are racist towards them. Um, They are seen as other, they're seen as different, they're seen as dangerous, exotic and are so often seen as a sexual threat as well. Um, And so this is based on the, the, the information that is being consumed by the British populace at the time is inherently racist. It's based on these notions, it's based on deeply ignorant deeply uh, prejudiced and discriminatory notions of racial difference. So you can kind of combine the two things. I think it's always too simple to separate them out and say it's purely economics or it's purely cultural and it's about demographics and it's about immigration. Um, It's a combination of the both, uh, as it was then, but also it's exactly the same now. When you try to understand these phenomena now, um, there is uh, kind of the mixing of these two sides of the debate. Yeah, clearly, yeah, very complex. And I think linking into that, uh, in your book, you call fascism a cockroach ideology with an uncanny survival instinct and this kind of ability to change and adapt. Um, and it's like the idea that if it can survive post-World War Two, it can literally survive kind of in whatever kind of cultural um, situation it's kind of placed in. Which is kind of very scary. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's a cockroach ideology in the sense that it is, um, it's liked by very few, but it seems to be unkillable. Mm, and yeah. um, if we can't, you know, if the gas, if the newsreel of gas chambers and mountains of dead bodies and six million dead people and five years or six years of war and tens of millions of people murdered across the continent does not end fascism, I just can't think of anything that will. 
and, and part of it is that there is its, its ability to adapt and change. As in this book, I talk about a, you know the way it changes and shifts outwardly, at least if not at its core, outwardly towards a different type of prejudice and discrimination in the form of anti-black racism, as to gain political capital. Those changes happen. The next big one in the British far right happens with the shift towards Islam and Muslims that begins post the Salman Rushdie affair, but obviously then gathers a pace post 9/11. The, this ability to change and to highlight different others, different threats, different enemies with which to rally around. Um, they, we've seen this time and time again. That's not just in Britain. We've seen it everywhere. There is that element to it. And then there is just these kind of slightly stranger, uh, more complex or more difficult to understand, you know, the, the, the nature of hatred, the nature of the person. There has always been hatred, the ability of the human species to do terrible things to each other, to lose its empathy. And at times it loses so much empathy it commits genocide and stuff. But at other times there's always enough of it uh, to, to result in there being enough. There's always far-right threat. There has never been a period in the 20th or 21st century without fascism or without the far right. And if you can go back, you know, lots of scholars that trace pre-fascist movements, you know, it's not like hatred was formed in Italy in 1922 when Mussolini decided so. These things go back through the human experience. And so it's a mixture of these things that's really depressing in some ways because it means the war will never be won. We'll never have a day where we sit back and go, okay, now great, um, fascism has been defeated, the far right is over. I mean, ironically, I remember in 2010, uh, I worked for, I started working for Hope Not Hate, this, the anti-fascist campaign, and, and at that election, the British National Party were wiped out. And I remember sitting there the next day, and a few of us were sitting around, we'd worked on the campaign and saying, well, what are we going to do with the rest of our lives? You know, now that fascism has been finished, you know, I mean, now it just sounds laughable, that, but it mm -hmm. genuinely felt like, oh, we've won, you know, and then within a week it makes, you know, it was clear that that wasn't the case, of course, but like, uh, this will be a never ending struggle against it. And, and each of these things, and I talk about it, some of it in the book, but, but also more broadly is, it's just a matter of keeping it in the corner. It's a, it's a game of firefighting. It's about like punching it enough that it, it, that it retreats and being wary that it will cause these moments where it can rise up and take over. Um, so it's never going to be one that we win, and that's because it is dynamic in the way it changes and the way it moves. Yeah, and I think trying to like scooch up a little bit to kind of the modern day, I think it's quite a relevant segue there, talking about its ability for survival. I'd just like you to kind of try and sketch out where are the far right now in 2020. You've talked about how they can be deemed more populist and fascist now. I wonder what you if you could expand on that. And also, one of the key themes of your book is talking about the emergence of these transatlantic fascist net networks in the 1950s. And it seems that now we've kind of got to a point where this has swelled beyond comprehension and now the alt-right kind of stands as this truly transnational movement. So yeah, if you could just, just, just sketch out where are we now, 2020, with the status of the far right? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I guess, I mean, there's there's a difference between where we are globally and now it really is a global story, but also um, where we are in Britain. And I think, um, generally speaking, globally, obviously, this is a, a period that's kind of pretty terrifying, even though Trump has just lost. We sit, sit here talking about Trump and obviously Trump, I don't think he's a fascist, but if we're talking about the far right, in a broader sense, we've just had, you know, we currently have a Trump as the president of America. We have Bolsonaro in Brazil. We have Narendra Modi in India, in, in Europe, we have uh, Duda, and we have you know, law and justice in Poland, we have Hungary with Orban, we have far-right representation in parliaments across the continent of Europe, um, some places in government, you know, we have a terrifyingly large front national in France, we have the Sweden Democrats, we have the Austrian Freedom Party, we have the re re emergence in the last decade of alternative for Deutschland, a far-right party in pa parliamentary chambers in Germany, something that would have thought been kind of inconceivable not too long ago. Vox in Spain, the Finns in Finland, you name it. We, we have this kind of far-right threat that is currently, again, once again across the continent of Europe, but also part of a kind of global movement of authoritarianism and, and uh, kind of in some places totalitarianism. So the international scene is, is it's a troubling and worrying time. In Britain, it's a, it's a strange one in some ways. I mentioned the British National Party earlier which was the most successful electoral far-right party in British history. It had two members of the European Parliament, a member of the London Assembly. It had, uh, you know, I think 64 councillors or roughly, you know, dozens of councillors across the country. But in 2010, that kind of wave crested and, and um, 
in the years that followed the British National Party completely collapsed and currently has no councillors and is the shadow of its former self. And so the traditional far right, the electoral far right, in some ways is in, in the toilet. The British National Party is finished, the National Front is over. Um, the, the kind of terrifyingly street movements like the English Defence League, the anti-Muslim groups that rose up in 2009 to 2012-ish, 13-ish, uh, that, that no longer exists in any kind of meaningful sense. And so many of the traditional organisations of the British far right uh, have dissipated and splintered. And what we've seen is two things. One is we've seen some people say, OK, if we weren't going to win electorally in 2010, we're certainly not going to win electorally now. And we've seen an emergence of much more extreme street level or terroristic threat. We had the National Action, which was banned by the government, first actually fascist organisation to be banned since the British Union of Fascists in 1940. And we've seen record numbers of far-right terrorists arrested in the UK in the last couple of years. Uh, so we've seen that side of it. And then the other side of it is it's a much more mainstream threat. You know, UKIP in some ways took the political space from the British National Party, but also the right of the Tories. We now have the Brexit Party with Nigel Farage, which is not a fascist, of course, but fits in a broad definition of the far right. Certainly it's radical right in its form. And that is, you know, won the last European elections in the United Kingdom. And then on top of all of this, we have this process of kind of mainstreaming, which in many ways the narratives that you would have heard from the British National Party a decade ago, uh, you can hear in mainstream or right, you know, right-wing newspapers, you can even hear it currently from elements of the Conservative government. If you hear Priti Patel recently talking about things like cross-channel migration, it's pretty hard to dis differentiate between some of the stuff that she's been saying and some of the stuff that the far right say about immigration and, and asylum seekers. So you've had this normalising and um, kind of mainstream, which is really worrying. And then on top of all this, of course, we live in the age of the internet. And uh, in many ways, the internet's radically altered the way in which social movements exist and the way that individuals engage with politics. And we've had the emergence of kind of a post-organizational far right. I mean, in my book, I talk about, you know, it's about organizations. It's about party structures. And I can go back into the archive and I can find membership cards and I can find leaders of regional branches and all those sorts of traditional political vehicles. Nowadays, we have this kind of post-organizational threat, which is thousands of people, some in the UK, some not, engaging in far-right politics outside of any sort of formalized or traditional structure. They do so online, they use social media, they use forums, they use telegram chats, etc. And they engage in far-right politics. And it's much better understood, almost like a school of fish. It moves in certain directions collectively, but there is no kind of formalized structure that bands them together. And that makes it very difficult. It turns the British far-right into a many-headed hydra. You can cut off one of the heads, but it's not going to uh, kill the body, if you will. So this sort of post-organizational thing, and this has come to the streets at times. In 2018, we had the biggest far-right demonstrations uh, since the period of Oswald Mosley. You know, there was, eight, you know, tens, there was uh, well over 10,000 people, or some could say 15 or 18,000, uh, on the streets around Tommy Robinson or Stephen Yaxley Lennon outside Parliament in 2018. These are numbers that would have dwarf even things like the English Defence League. And they do look and they do hark back to that period when Mosey was filling arenas. So, and, and yet most of the people on that, some of them would have been part of political parties and things, but most of them weren't. Most of them were people that just consume far-right content online outside of these structures. So we have a terrorist threat. Uh, we have like this post-organisational threat. And then we have this mainstream threat. And the kind of what is lacking is things like those more traditional far-right parties. You know, we have patriotic alternative at the moment in the United Kingdom, a racial nationalist group, but it remains small. So it's a bit of a hodgepodge scene at the moment. And we'll have to see is, in many ways, like in the book I talk about the union movement, which brought together 52, I think, fascist groups into a single organ organization. And you have these moments of divergence and, and collectivity. And you have the union movement in forty late 40s. You have the National Front, which again brings together lots of groups and stuff in 1967. Then you have the BNP. And in each of these periods, they bring together a splintered scene. Currently, we have a hugely splintered scene. And we'll have to see if anything emerges which unites. It. It's always better that they're splintered than it is that they're united, though. Yeah, that's some really interesting comments there. I've got a couple of questions which arose out of it. Uh, first of all, um, you kind of talk of this gravitational pull of the far right and their ability to kind of shift um, the political discourse to the right. And I think a good example of that is the the campaigning that we're seeing, um, that we saw over the summer, the migrant arrivals across the channel, uh, and these 
beach patrols uh, from organisations like Britain First and Nigel Farage's um, series of ob abhorrent uh, videos and stuff that he made on that. But um, yeah, if you could expand on what happened over the summer there and is that reminiscent of, you know, classic tropes and to what extent do you think that that's, that that's an example of the far right being able to shift the discourse because... Yeah, Pretty Patel's kind of it's almost like a competition of like who can, you know, slate them the hardest in the discourse on Twitter by some right wing commentators over the summer was, you know, just it comes to the point of discussing like barbed wire fences in the middle of the sea and just like a ridiculous kind of like competition which is just very repulsive. But have you got any comments on that? Yeah, I mean it's it's been a really worrying summer actually. I mean in some ways, it's a bit of an interesting thing. I mentioned that kind of post-organizational stuff, but if you go back to May, we started to pick up these, these what they would call themselves citizen journalists, right? But I would call them far-right activists. <laughs> but um, this group of collect, small collection of people, one was called Active Patriot, uh, one was called Lit Little Veteran, and there was a host of them. And they started turning up in Dover with camera equipment and filming the arrival of cross-channel migrant boats. These kind of images that I'm sure everyone's seen of like migrants coming across from France on small dinghies and the like. And they started to do this every day. They would film the boats arriving, they would film migrants getting onto coaches. And of course, in the grand scheme of migration and global immigration and asylum seekers, Britain is tiny. You know, I mean, mo all of Europe is tiny. Most of, of course, the numbers are in, in the Middle East, but Germany is the only one that is anywhere near anything that's in the Middle East, and certainly not France or Britain. So, despite the fact the numbers are tiny, this kind of drip drip effect starts to happen where these individuals start to create this content and they disseminate it through things like YouTube, Twitter, so also major social media platforms. And it starts to get picked up on Telegram, which is like a social media app used really largely by the far right. And it starts to really animate the far right. The far right, and for many years, immigration. Uh, had in some ways kind of slipped down the agenda a little bit. It was all about Islam, it was about Muslims, it was about you know post-77 bombings and Lee Rigby and all that stuff. The British far right were just obsessed with Islam and Muslims and immigration in a much broader sense hadn't been talked about this vociferously since the early 2000s. But this drip drip effect starts to obviously cause real anger in the movement and this is when you get to see the more traditional figures pick it up again. In some way I talk in the book about them seeing that there is anger growing about this and taking to, you know, seeking to make political capital. You get the Britain first, as you mentioned, and for Britain, another, this is like an anti-Muslim political party, see these videos that are doing the rounds. You also then see Nigel Farage picking up on this sort of content and then start to make political capital out of it. So Britain first, go to hotels and they've these videos that will make your blood boil, where they go into these hotels where migrants are being accommodated at the moment and knock on doors and stick cameras in these people's faces as if they're not vulnerable enough. Um, it's pretty ugly politics. And they seek to make capital out of it. And before Britain have uh, demonstrations outside of hotels in the same way. Nigel Farage starts making his own videos where he goes to the hotels and starts to write articles for things like the Daily Express about the issue. And it really is, I think, a really worrying example of how something that started with a small group of far-right figures individually creating online content starts to work its way through the ecosystem of the British far right and increasingly into the mainstream to the point where you've got Priti Patel coming out with some pretty horrible and ugly politics herself and talking about pretty shameful rhetoric around activist lawyers and all this sort of stuff. And so, yeah, I think it's a really, really worrying case study of how the British far right can affect the mainstream. And it's also symbiotic, of course. The more that the mainstream then talks about these issues, the more people then look to the far right for more extreme answers. And then the more that the far right whip it up as an issue the more that the mainstream right believes that it can make political capital out of it. And we've seen this time and time again. Uh, the fear that the best way to deal with the far right is to outflank it by being just as horrible. You know, and this is not just the Conservative Party. You know, we saw the Labour Party talking about British jobs for British workers, you know, a slogan that would have traditionally sat within the National Front and the British National Party, you know, tough on immigration mugs from the Labour Party, etc. This is not just the Conservatives, the whole of the centre of politics tries to shift right. And unfortunately, all that serves to do is legitimise the politics of the far right. They're never going to outflank it. And so it's been a really worrying year. In some ways, we've been lucky. You know, if you look at the reaction of anti-migrant movements in other parts of the continent, especially in Germany and Sweden, for example, this sort of politics has resulted in arson attacks. You know, you can go back to famous, terrible, shocking stories like the 
with so-called barbecue at Rostock in Germany many decades ago where migrants were murdered. And uh, We haven't had that this summer here yet. We have seen, obviously, someone try to attack a lawyer with a knife. We have seen some low-level attacks where individual migrants and asylum seekers have been attacked outside hotels, but we haven't seen anything terrible happen. And in some way, that's a real surprise and a shock, considering the vociferousness of the rhetoric around the, the, around the issue. Yeah, I think that's well summed up and yeah, extremely worrying and just extremely sad as well. There's, you know, I've watched one of them videos when they when they went into the hotel, which the uh, which the migrants were in, refugees, um, and it just it kind of made me want to weep in a way. It's just terrible, really, it's going on, but I do appreciate... It's uh, unbelievable. It, there's no other way to look at it other than, you know, it may, it, you know if, if people don't, if watch it and don't want to weep, or don't get furious about it. You know, where is the heart? It's they, those videos are sickening, and like only one person's been arrested for Britain first for that. But just the, the ethos of thinking like I'm going to pile into a hotel where people that have just got off a boat and risk their life coming across, um, uh, you know, coming across the channel, but probably have backstories of risking their life numerous times in the last mm -hmm. few years, getting out of places all over Africa and Asia, and, and then think you're going to stick a camera in their face because you know that your far right support is going to like it. Um, it's very important not to kind of dehumanise the far right, but it's monstrous behaviour, you know, and it is really, really ugly. And uh, there's only, you know, the only re sane reaction is to be outraged and to try and do something about it. I think. Absolutely, yeah, and I appreciate, and I do appreciate the the kind of meticulous monitoring of it that that hope not hate have been doing because I think that's it definitely will be useful. I've got two more things I want to ask you about whilst I still have you. The first one is this idea of conspiracy theories and whether you can spot any kind of legacies or genealogies from the book that you wrote in terms of conspiratorial thinking and what we see today i don't know if it's a bit of a stretch but a, a quote a quote really stuck out to me um in one of in your book uh, i think it was the biographer of uh, that chesterton um and he basically said that this guy is going to be remembered as responsible for spreading and developing a tradition of conspiracy thinking um, so if you could, yeah, maybe just expand on the legacies of these conspiracies and where are we today with the current state of conspiracies now? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, actually. Um, so, yeah, in the book, I talk at length about a guy called A.K. Chesterton, who's actually the cousin of the author G.K. Chesterton, who also had a pretty ugly anti-Semitic past as well. Uh, but at least G.K. wrote interesting books. Um, A.K. didn't. But A.K. Chesterton had been a member of the British Union of Fascists. Uh, he became an alcoholic and was sent to Nazi Germany to clean up. And he comes back and actually, in some ways, he's a very British fascist. He refuses to, he, he's not interned during the war. He offers to fight for Britain. He's a kind of English nationalist, English patriot. But his, increasingly through his career, he becomes obsessed with Jews. He becomes fanatically anti-Semitic. But unlike his kind of people that he was around at the time, some people like uh, Arnold Lees, for example, who was genocidal and it was about biology, for A.K. Cheston it was conspiratorial. Uh, he wrote a famous book called The New Unhappy Lords, which is still used by kind of anti-Semitic groups to this day. And basically, it was all building upon the, the famous forgery, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, this, this supposed book which proved that there was a secret cabal of Jews running the world. And he uh, fundamentally believed this idea and fundamentally believed that there were, for him, the big thing was the British Empire. You know, as the British Empire starts to crumble throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, he sets up something called the League of Empire Loyalists, with, uh, and he essentially explains British imperial decline through an anti-Semitic lens, that there is a secret plot to bring down the British Empire um, because it's the bulwark against the Jewish world power. And he writes these kind of conspiratorial texts that sees a secret hand in all of these historical events. And so in that way, yeah, and, and he's one of the few figures in British far right or fascist scene that has created uh, content that has had influence beyond Britain. You know, you start to see his books picked up by international fascists in the post-war period and you can still see them, you know, sold in some cases by American fascist groups and the like. And he also becomes this birthing pool for a lot of the big figures in the rest of the British fashion or fascist scene, like John Tyndall, uh, who was in the National Front, Martin Webster, they all came through Chesterton's uh, League of Empire Loyalists. And the parallels, I guess, is that this summer we've seen an explosion of con engagement with conspiracy politics. Uh, during the kind of global pandemic, we've seen huge numbers of people engaging with conspiracy theories online. Um, in some ways, of course, the, the huge difference is in the age of the internet, the ability to access this content is just incomprehensibly easier. If you wanted to buy Chesterton's books, you had to write to 
his magazine Kanda, and you had to you know or buy it off a fascist book list, or uh, you weren't going to stumble across most of his writings in mainstream bookshops. Now, of course, you can just go onto Facebook, and the place is awash with conspiracy theories about five G, um, China consciously spreading the vaccine. Bill Gates is putting microchips into people. All of these sorts of things, uh, and the worrying element to it is is that one of the key figures, for example, is David Icke. You know, former footballer and you know Britain's most famous contemporary conspiracy theorist, and I saw him recently speak at um, Trafalgar Square in London in front of ten thousand people who adored him. And yet, if you watch and read David Icke, at its core is the notion of a Jewish world conspiracy. At its core is the idea is what he calls Rothschild Zionists run the world, a secret cabal of Jews pulling the strings of major world events. Uh, this is no different to the belief system of A.K. Chesterton in many ways. Uh, the difference now is that the numbers are much larger, and it's not just people that were joining the Empire Loyalists, which were kind of you know old military types and right-wing conservatives. Uh, you go to these demonstrations now, there's all sorts of people there. They're multi-ethnic, they're multi-aged, and lots of the people are getting this, engaging with this line, uh, kind of stuff on social media. Now, a huge chunk of the people that are getting involved in conspiracy scene at the moment during this lockdown are not anti-Semitic in any way and would be utterly appalled if you called them anti-Semitic. Um, but others are. And in some ways, if you start to have individuals that have long believed in various conspiracies, so one could be global warming is a lie. Another one is someone else believes that vaccines are awful. Someone else believes that Wi-Fi or 5G is dangerous. When you start to tie those together, which is what we've seen in part this summer, into what are called super conspiracies, which is a single guiding explanation for all of these various events, then you have to have someone pulling the strings. Then you have to have some sort of new world order, as, as it would have traditionally been called. But you have to have some sort of puppet master that is making these different things happen. And invariably, when you move down that route, you move towards Jewish world conspiracy. And so while not everyone who starts off believing that the world is flat and that moon landings are fate will end up believing that the Holocaust didn't happen, a certain number of them will. You know, I think it's worth looking at it like a bookshelf, the conspiracy bookshelf. And you start off with relatively benign conspiracies about the moon landings. And as you work your way along, the final book on the shelf is, is Holocaust denial. And the more people that engage at the top end of that, the more people that end up at the, the, the more extreme end of it. So it's really, really worrying. You know, there are huge similarities about this worldview, both from, you know, throughout the 20th century within the fascist scene. And, of course, we've seen fascists this summer try to exploit this. You know, we've consciously seen fascists go into conspiracy groups on Facebook and put links to Holocaust and our material underneath posts about anti-lockdown rhetoric with a view to try and saying you need to really open your eyes properly. So it's a really worrying, concerning time. You know, it's, uh, it's, and it's too early to say where this is going to end up and the scale of it where it's going to be. But um, once again, the tech companies have dropped the ball on this and they're now trying to catch up. But it might be too late. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a worrying prospect and just the kind of sh sheer speed w with which they can be disseminated now. Um, I think it's definitely pause for uh, some level of anxiety. But um, you mentioned David Icke and how he was possessive of all these anti Semitic views. And subsequently, because of that, he was deplatformed. Uh, I think fairly recently. Yeah. Um, and I just, as my last question, I would like you to expand on this idea of deplatforming because it seems to have been very successful with the likes of Milo Yiannopoulos and um, the infamous Stephen Yaxley uh, Lennon, aka Tommy Robinson. So, yeah, if you could just um, talk about your views on uh, deplatforming people with really dangerous and pernicious ideas. Yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, I mean, it was actually Hope Not Hate that got Ike deplatformed. Uh, we we oh, put was it? Doss dossier and nice. gave it to Facebook and said, you know, you need to get rid of him. But um, deplatforming is not a silver bullet in the sense that it's not like a, a cure-all. It's not going to end fascism or it's not going to end the far right. But I think it is a useful tactic. And um, there's like straw man arguments that seem to that are you know that, that essentially say that people like myself believe that no deplatforming is, you know, p perfect and it's going to end it all. And if you get rid of someone off Facebook, they disappear as a problem. That's not, of course, true. But what it does do is really important, and that is, there's different types of social media platforms. Uh, there's essentially mainstream platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok. You then have what we would call kind of co-opted platforms. So those are smaller platforms generally that have a far-right problem on them. So that might be something like Discord or 
Steam or one of those. And then you have bespoke platforms, which are made by the far right, for the far right. Things like um, BitChute and, and kind of video streaming services like that, or Gab, or etc. And basically, they each serve different purposes. And the mainstream platforms like Facebook and YouTube is where far right figures engage with normal people. And I mean normal in a broad sense, or non-far right people. And that is, can be, in one sense, really dangerous in that they that's where they target people and where people are become victims of their hate crimes uh, because normal people or uh, non-white people are on these platforms and the far right have an ability to reach them with hate. But also it's where that they propagandize, it's where they spread their content, it's where they find new supporters. And so getting them off those mainstream platforms cuts that off. It cuts off their ability to target people because they end up on far right designed platforms where there are no people who disagree with them. And it also stops their ability to reach new people and, and spread their politics, which is extremely useful. And I think there's a number of examples that have been remarkable on this. You know, Britain First had a huge Facebook following. It had you know, well over a million. Tommy Robinson's Facebook was bigger than any of the major political parties in the UK. And huge amounts of people would engage with his content, sometimes not knowingly. Britain First used to run campaigns where they would say, like this poppy. And loads of people would like it, not knowing that the far right were behind it and it would bring people in. And getting them off the platform has hugely reduced their reach. You know, both of those, Britain First and, and Tommy Robinson, remain important on the British far right. But the numbers that they can get to the streets uh, is tiny compared to what it used to be. Tommy Robinson now brings 100 or 200 or 300 people to the streets. In 2018, when he had all these major platforms, there was 15,000 people on the streets. Most people don't come across his content anymore. His ability to reach people has been hugely diminished, and that's really, really important. It doesn't mean that once they end up on some Telegram channel that we just ignore it. Once they're on those platforms that are more extreme and smaller, that's where they plot, that's where they plan, that's where they radicalize. But we just have to make sure we're in those spaces too. So it's not a perfect tactic, but I think that time and time again we've seen how useful it's been. And the tech platforms for all of their talk of being lovely and going to change the world and make the great place, they have done some vile and terrible things in the last decade, which has caused huge problems. We've seen so many movements emerge and cause real-world harm. You know, you mentioned the conspiracy scene, QAnon, the fate, you know, this kind of new conspiracy that people are talking about over the last three or four years, but have come to the UK in its meaningful sense this year, this idea that there's a secret cabal of satanic paedophiles running the world. Sounds ludicrous, but um, can have really dangerous real-world effects. This is, was born on social media, and it um, spread rapidly on social media, and we saw groups emerge really quickly with hundreds of thousands of people engaging with this content. Um, and it's the, you know, the horse is bolted, and the tech companies are trying to put it back in, and I think that there is an obligation for anyone who cares about this stuff to continue to pressurize those platforms and continue to report people, and when you see people break in terms of conditions, get stuck in and, and report them. Because it's not going to cure this problem, but getting them off these major platforms will certainly hamper their ability to grow. I think, yeah, very well put. And, yeah, it's comforting to know that some of these figures seem unlikely to kind of uh, resurface from the deplatforming. Although I think, yeah, you're right to put that caution in there that just because their ability to reach people has been reduced doesn't necessarily mean we, we can or should consider that the problem over. So, yeah, I hope, but with some caution there. <laughs> I suppose yeah. to finish on but yeah I'll, I'll finish it here uh, just because I don't want to keep you too long but it's been a truly fascinating conversation and I really appreciate you um, giving up some of your time and yeah thanks very much no thanks for having us really enjoyed it